Hey, what's going on everyone? Today I'm going to take you with me as I do a lap around Redondo Beach. And by that I mean we will launch out of King Harbor, which is here. And then we will paddle south and then try to make bait around here in shallow water. You know, maybe around 40, 50 feet. Once we make bait, we will take that bait and paddle to the PV area and work the kelp line in the hopes of running into exotics like yellowtail. If that's not happening, we will then paddle out to the ledge of the canyon in the deeper water, you know, to 300 feet, and see if we can hook up to some rockfish. After that, we will paddle back and maybe stop by the Palawan Wreck on the way back into the harbor. So on today's trip, I uh, had a couple of new guys with me, and I'm always leery about taking new people out because, you know, on days like this, we'll paddle 12 miles and we could be on the water for 12 hours, which is what happened. And so, because I care about my fellow human being, I'm always very, very explicit in terms of describing what they might encounter. And because I don't like, you know, sitting in one place, posting up and soaking and praying, it means a lot of paddling. A lot of uh, running and gunning so if I get a reply like hey yeah man let's do this then I feel good about taking that person out so anyways uh, these guys ended up doing a great job so today we have a party of five we got, we got Kai back there somewhere but in the past we would all be clumped together on the way to the uh, kelp beds and then we finally figured out that we should really be like spread apart, like west coast spread offense to find the bait because if you don't have bait, it's going to be hard to catch exotics. So we're going to be spread out and whoever finds the mackerel is going to holler. So between the five of us, we're probably covering at least 100 yards in terms of width in our search for bait. Now it is just lighting up, okay? These are all probably mackerel right here. So you definitely want to make bait and they're shallow, like 20 feet and below. This is where you want to be if you want to make bait. Okay, so we've located the bait, but they're picky. So, um, you know, again, two ounce jig. This is a little bit of a Procure sardine or something like that. So we'll see. I should mention that with the jig I'm working with, what I've done is I've crushed the barbs so that once I catch the mackerel, I can take them off the hooks without mangling them. But again, the drawback is a lot of them will pop off if I don't maintain the perfect amount of uh, tautness on the line. And the other thing I'm, I think I'm noticing is that depending on what time of year you catch the mackerel, they can be a different size. So I've only been doing this a couple of years, but I think around this time, like late March and early April, they're just about the right size. Um, you know, the size of a candy bar, which is ideal ah. for hunting exotics with. Because I'm using barbless hooks, it's always a challenge. In terms of keeping the bait alive once you catch them, I used to use one of these Fraybill bait buckets, I think you call them. And the problem with these things is they create so much drag. I might not be exaggerating when I say you could lose an entire mile per hour when dragging one of these things around. I mean, it, drag is such a huge component. I mean, you try dragging like a, a six pack of beer on the water and you will definitely feel it. So ultimately I ended up looking on YouTube and creating this guy. Um, I created mine out of ABS plastic, but I think most people use PVC plastic and it's easier to work with and probably just as durable and a lot cheaper. So I would probably go with the PVC route and I will leave a link in the description. And if you do decide to build one of these things and deploy it, don't be an Alexander Dumas like me and put the bait in head first. You have to put them in the tail first, otherwise they're gonna be doing the moonwalk for 10 miles. Okay, so this is the uh, ABS plastic bait tube that I'm gonna, I'm gonna be using right here to uh, store the bait. 
I don't know if you can see, but clearly the yellow tailor is starting to show because look at all the boats off, uh, off the kelp beds. So I've got a uh, live mackerel on there and it's basically just a waiting game, right? I'm trying to hit a home run and again, like when you try to hit a home run, the downside is you might strike out. So we'll see what happens. Got the Goodyear blimp out. Not sure why they would be hanging out here, but that's pretty cool. We ended up soaking live bait near the kelp line for an hour or two. And really, uh, in terms of the scientific factors like water movement, it wasn't going to be a great day. I think there was about a quarter moon, three eighths or something like that, which means there wasn't going to be a lot of uh, tidal change in water movement. And on top of that, we were, by the time we got to the kelp line, it was probably around 10.30 or 11. And I think realistically, you need to be in the water with good, lively live bait by gray light, I think, if you're serious about hunting exotics. And so after fan casting a few times with the Shimano Cold Sniper and trying a couple of vertical drops, my adult ADD kicked in and told me that we had to move. Okay, so the exotics are not cooperating, so we're going to head out to uh, see what we can do about the rockfish. We still have some live bait, so we're going to drop the live bait down and see what we can do. So we know that there are rockfish here. We're just kind of hoping that by pinning a you know big live bait, then we might pick up maybe a lingcod or something like that. That's the game plan, anyways. That's a big fish. So we're over a, a hump, and um, is it a fish? Yeah, that's oh damn! <laughs> that's a big one. So what happens here is that Z gets picked up. By a pretty big fish but these big fish don't get big by being stupid that fish immediately took him under some kind of structure and trust me this was a big fish that's a heavy rod and unfortunately uh, we can't get that fish out of the uh, structure At this point, I feel like I've kept you guys as a captive audience too long and I need to show you the uh, obligatory fish catching video. But really, pay more attention to the audio rather than the video. Maybe two, three pounds. Okay, look. So, it's really hard to stay on top of this spot, right? Especially if you don't have a pedal kayak. So what I'm gonna do is and the fish really aren't biting right now, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stay stationary and you guys just make sure that you're always near me, okay? Because if you drift 50 feet, you ain't gonna get bit. Hold on, let me reel this guy up and then set up shop, okay? And you drop right next to me. Not a bad fish, not a bad fish. So what the audio is detailing is the difficulty for newbies, and, and I've seen almost every newbie struggle with this, is just how difficult it is to remain stationary. It sounds simple, but it's actually very difficult. You know, sometimes you're gonna be dealing with wind, sometimes you're gonna be dealing with current, and sometimes you're gonna be dealing with both. Now, there are some tricks that you can deploy to kind of help you stay in place. Number one, put the nose of the kayak into the wind. So let's say you come out here and you're posted up here on top of, say, 250 feet. Instead of fishing right away, take inventory of which way the wind is blowing. So if the wind is coming here, coming out of here, 
like a southwest, you want to put the nose of the kayak into the wind because if you let your kayak get broadside, it'll quickly blow you off the mark. Trick number two, take inventory of the notable land features. So again, if you're posted up here, you know that south is represented by this point of land and you know that east is represented by the harbor. So if you look down at your fish finder and it's telling you, hey, you're off the mark, you need to go in a heading of 180. Well, then you know you need to kind of paddle toward the point of land. And if you don't want to be bothered with any of that stuff, the Garmin, at least, has a feature called the compass tape, which is right here. Okay, And it's basically dummy ease for, hey, go this way. <laughs> so basically, you just paddle where you see yellow here. So. Um, in this um, example, you want to keep paddling left, for example, until you see less and less yellow. And uh, at the point where you see no yellow, then you're headed in the right direction. Okay, back to fishing. Um, after we picked up a few rockfish here, we decided to paddle toward home and then make a stop here at the Palawan Wreck. Now, a while back, I assembled a video showing you how to fish the Palaman wreck, but let me show you something. I'm gonna zoom way in here, okay? And again, with my previous video, I had given you uh, one GPS coordinate, but I wanna show you just how big the Palawan wreck is, okay? I mean, this is Google being able to depict it from a satellite, all right? So let me show you this. This is the Palawan wreck. It is not a little ship. This was a repair ship that was deployed in World War II. It is 441 feet long and probably what, like 60 feet wide? So my point is, the Palawan wreck isn't one GPS coordinate. As a matter of fact, you could probably drop 50 waypoints on and around the wreck. You're gonna find Palawan Wreck in about 120 feet of water. And even if you are a fish finder newbie, Palawan is gonna be hard to miss. So here's how I would fish Palawan. And um, I'm zoomed in here and um, you have to be able to imagine this is about 440 feet, okay? Now, first of all, you know that I am not a patient fisherman. So I'm not gonna post up here um, and fish it for like 30, 40 minutes trying different uh, scents, colors, shapes, etc, etc. I'm gonna drop down, you know, a couple, three times here. And if I don't get action, I'm gonna move. It's, it's that simple. You know, I'm just gonna run and gun. And what I've noticed is that if there are fish to be caught, you're gonna catch them in the first couple of drops. And, and usually within the first drop, you're gonna pick off the fish or a couple of fish that are really hungry or dumb. Then after that, the action seems to just go away. So drop down once or twice, maybe three times. If you don't get bit, just move 50 feet. And as long as you're seeing good structure on your fish finder, just keep running and gunning. And if you work hard enough and hustle, you're gonna catch fish, unless the water is like super duper cold. Okay, I'm gonna go back to fishing, and I mean it this time for real reels. That always happens around here, huh? <laughs> we got the, um, we're on top of Palawan, the sand bass and the calico bass uh, action's picking up. We got Josh on something here. Looks like a pretty good one. Oh, nice. Nice sand bass. Yeah, that's a nice one. Wow. Josh, give yourself some slack, brother. There you go. It's a nice one, man. Yeah, uh, a boy. Good. One. Nice day on the water. I mean, we were out here from about eight to about five thirty. Okay, that about wraps it up. The video went a little bit longer than I would have liked, but um, a great day on the water. Nice weather. Good people. You know, the fishing wasn't off the charts great, but you know what they say, a bad day on the water is still better than any day at the office. So I'm going to leave you with some footage of a new friend that we made. As always, thank you for dropping by. Get out there, 
have fun, be safe, and we will see you on the next trip. Bye for now.